The Best of Living in Iowa is funded in part by the Gilchrist Foundation. Founded by Jocelyn Gilchrist, furthering the philanthropic interests of the Gilchrist family in wildlife and conservation, the arts and public broadcasting, and disaster relief. Funding for this program was provided by Friends, the Iowa Public Television Foundation. Generations of families and friends who feel passionate about the programs they watch on Iowa Public Television. Hello, this is Morgan Halgren. For 16 seasons, Living in Iowa told the tale of what it means to be uniquely Iowan. Tonight, we honor that spirit by bringing you another glimpse into our rich heritage with a few stories from our archives. In this episode of The Best of Living in Iowa, we'll revisit Iowans from the greatest generation who flew in the B-17 Flying Fortress on dangerous bombing missions during World War II. Speak with Paponi, a Native American artist who tells stories through her pottery and talk with David Bellin, a Des Moines lawyer who was part of the Warren Commission that investigated the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. One of the highest casualty rates of World War II came from the B-17 flight crews who braved the unfriendly skies to deliver strategic bombing strikes that changed the course of the war. Many of these young men displayed a kind of courage and patriotism that went beyond their years. Now, 50 years later, we'd like you to listen to some of their memories and think about the sacrifices they made. These last moments are the most vulnerable minutes of the mission. Although the planes are under intensive anti-aircraft fire, the bombardiers must be precise and accurate. Air Force group over the tower, and they got our number, and that ACK ACK was come out, you couldn't believe it. 88 went into the nose, blew the nose off that airplane, and down it went. We didn't, we never saw a shoot. The first reunion, 15 years ago, here's Jake Smart, 84 years old, with a wooden leg. We asked him what happened. They, he, they blew it, he blew clear, him and the co-pilot were blown clear of the airplane leg was blown off. He landed two miles from a German airfield. They picked him up, and he survived. The B-17, it was a real rugged airplane. It would come back. We had holes in it several different times. It would take a lot of damage and still get home. A guy in an air crew probably got more lead thrown at him than even an infantry man. But the good thing about being in the Air Force was we had a good bed to sleep in and good food when we got back. For the bomber crews, a soft bed and a hot meal were the only benefits for flying through the machine gun fire of German fighter planes, the flak explosions from anti-aircraft guns, and the freezing temperatures of high altitude flying. And today, with a refurbished B-17 known as the aluminum overcast, these World War II veterans have a tangible reminder of the fears they faced and the courage they displayed each time their crew was airborne. This airplane was manufactured in April 1945 by uh, uh, Lockheed. It never saw any combat action because it was built too late. And uh, they had so many guns on it that it looked like a, a, actually a fort, and then that's how it got its name, the Flying Fortress. The biggest enemy is still the single-engine fighter plane. Now, you bombardiers, take your time in going in on your releases. This is the type of target you don't want to have to go back after the second we time. We had a, a lot of crews that we never even got acquainted with because there was crews that come in there and only made one or two missions, and it was all over with, you know. But uh, there was crews that brought home some planes that uh, just impossible to bring home almost. <laughs> And I best can describe what it was like to fly a B-17 would be like driving a semi-truck without power steering. See, everything was cable controlled. There was no boost. And it was strictly an Armstrong method of, of wrestling that airplane. At the age of 21, Claire Harper piloted 15 long-range bombing missions and wrote just as many farewell letters. This clipping appeared in the Stars and Stripe and was on the first bombing mission that I flew. 
The bombing mission was 75 miles east of Berlin. It was a ruined oil refinery. And I flew it on the 15th of March. And this plane going down in flames was a buddy of mine who got hit with flak as we were starting our bomb run. I flew five consecutive days. And at the end of the fifth day, I was no longer afraid of dying. In fact, you'd welcome it because you were so scared. Uh, you would see that flak ahead of the airplane and pray to God that uh, the next burst wouldn't hit you. And you could sit there and, and be flying in formation and look out there and see a B-17 flying along and look over here and look back and all once you, all you'd see was just a puff of smoke and a bunch of pieces. Our plane was shot down over Bremen in October of 1943. And uh, I bailed out and delayed the opening of my parachute for uh, quite some time. I was probably about 4,000 feet when I opened it. In fact, the plane landed within, it landed a little before I did, and I was so close to it that I uh, could feel the burning, the heat from the burning plane. This particular mission, the one that we flew on the 24th of March over Berlin, was some 1,500 miles at 35,000 feet, which was the highest mission I'd ever flown. And if you'd have taken your hand out of your leather flying glove and touched any part of the airplane, it would have stuck right there. It was very, very cold up there. And uh, after a mission coming home, well, we'd have what you'd call an in-flight lunch. And if you can imagine, eating a cheese sandwich had been frozen uh, with an oxygen mask on. That's, uh, it was our in-flight lunches coming back from a bombing mission. This is the uh, tail gun here. It uh, two twin 50 caliber machine guns. And it uh, was manned by one person in the back uh, and he, he took care of anything that came up behind him. Many close calls. For the tail gunner, one was mighty close. The top turret was uh, manned by the engineer. Uh, uh, he stood in uh, essentially a cylinder, and it was operated by foot pedals, which he turned and could control, control the gun, direction of the guns from that position. When he wasn't in that, he was acting as engineer, uh, assisted the pilot, co-pilot. The ball turret probably was, was the most deadliest of all the guns for the uh, uh, German fighters. If, if they saw the ball turret not turning, boy, they they come in and really come in from the bottom and got him. section uh, carried two people up there. It carried the bombardier and it carried a navigator. The bombardier is the one that sits furthest forward and he's the one that controlled the bomb site and he also controlled the chin turret. Uh, the navigator, he controlled the side guns in the nose section up here. This is probably the most vulnerable section on, in the airplane as, in combat as, as far as uh, casualty wise. When they brought me to the hospital, they, they, they put me up on a table. And uh, this blue-eyed Aryan German head doctor looks at me and... Parachuting out of a B-17 bomber moments how, before how it plummeted it into the Baltic uh, Sea, Harry Long was if, one of only two crew members to survive. If you were English, I'd cut that leg off. But since you're American, I'll try to save it. And for this airman, the war was over, and the memory of his only bombing mission is a stark reminder of the danger these crews faced. Despite the horrors of war, there were moments of honor. While I was coming down in the air, two 
Bulky Wolf uh, fighter pilots came toward me and I was trying to yank my parachute cords to uh, try and throw their aim off. But uh, they just, when they got close to me, they divided and went on each side of me. And the one that I was looking at waved his hands at me as, as he went by. And they, both of them, I think, wiggled their wings at me. They knew that I wasn't going anywhere since I was in that far into Germany. In rural Decatur City, we found a Native American artist whose career is in perfect harmony with her philosophy. She knew the earth would provide all she needed for her pottery, so her art honors that gift in return. I think all Native people have long known and believed and tried to respect the, the idea of the Creator, the Creator who creates everything. Sometimes we refer to it as the great mystery. The, the spirit that's in and through all things um, is alive in everything, whether it's a tree or, or a, a stone or uh, the four-leggeds and, and even in the Mother Earth herself, which is the clay, the spirit of that is alive, it's living, and it's um, very aware of its place in nature. And because Native people are aware of that themselves from living in nature so many generations that we have tried to create our thinking and our actions to be respectful of everything that's living. This is no ordinary fire. It is an ancient fire fueled by a desire to honor nature and create beauty. In a more literal sense, it is also fueled by a recycled material which has borne fire for thousands of years, dried buffalo dung. As you can see, dung creates a lot of smoke. The smoke and flames are embedding themselves in the pottery created by this artist. My Indian name, Paponi, is, is from the Kickapoo tribe translates into Snow Woman. In the early 80s, Paponi and her husband Greg started working on their dream, to run a pottery business in rural southern Iowa. They moved to Greg's old family farm, living not in the rundown house, but in the hog shed. We just had to try it and see if it worked. And um, I don't think Greg's dad ever probably even imagined that there'd be pots coming out of that studio. but. Paponi drew upon her native Kickapoo and Potawatomi heritage for survival skills. Come on, girl. Here, mama. Come on. Don't press your luck. After several years of experimenting with horse dung and borrowing buffalo dung from the reservation, on, Paponi and Greg began keeping Come two on, adult mama. bison on their land. Come on, sweetie. That a girl. Come on, mama. I think she's gonna miss her pile. Come on, Buffalo here. dung really is the best. You it gets it. the results, it burns hot, um, creates, helps create the patterns that I'm looking for. So it's time tested, you know, as they say. It's not something that I invented or that anybody happened upon in the 20th century. This, this way of firing, uh, primitive firing, has been done probably for hundreds and hundreds of years on this continent alone. And of course, the buffalo were here long before the horses were. The pots created in this atmosphere have many stories to tell. The buffalo pot, I would have to say, is probably the um, core of my work. It's probably what I'm best known for. As you can see, there's four buffalo on this pot walking around the pot. And they're sculpted in a low relief, so they're coming at you. And the name of the pot's called Buffalo Nation, and it's designed to really honor the living buffalo that are alive today. The, the herds throughout this country. Um, I wanted to represent them and speak about them on the clay because as you guys know, it, it wasn't too long ago when we just about lost them all. And in my tribe, we literally could not have survived into the 20th century without the buffalo. 
very important to us for lots of things, food, shelter, and clothing. And so really I'm trying to honor the living herd of buffalo today with this pot by speaking about them on the pot as well as firing the pot in the buffalo dung. Sometimes I notice when they're when they're marked by the fire, the fire has some very great ways of um, treating each character on the pot like it belongs there. One time uh, on the, the male dancer, he's carrying a prayer pipe in his hand. There was a trail of smoke coming up out of his pipe, just, just perfect. And sometimes you'll see other animal shapes or faces that appear on there naturally. So we've learned through the years that it, it's uh, very important to uh, work as well as you can, as well as you know how with, with the, the proper attitude, but ultimately the fire and the smoke have the say. To reach her goal of making beautiful, colorful pots without using glazes, Paponi uses Greg's careful studies of rock science. This stone here, if it was ground up into a powder, would add fire temperance to the clay body, so it would have less uh, chances of cracking in the firing. This pot has taken about three, three and a half years of um, working to get these colors. Sometimes the downside of primitive firing is that there is loss. Um, pots can get too hot too quickly on you or they're just vulnerable to the flames and they will crack and break often. But the upside is every now and then you get one like this. It's very unusual. The work is a family effort which for Paponi includes Greg and her two sons and all her relations, the plants, the elements, the animals, and the native people, whose teachings of reverence and ceremony are extremely important and meaningful to her. So I think when you look at my pots, you'll see a lot of animals and certain people on the pots uh, that I know personally and that uh, probably don't even know they're on the pots, but, but they've, been that, they've had that much impact in my life that I, I feel it's important to, to record them that way. They still work out of the hog shed, although they've added some amenities and are envisioning a time when they can build a new studio. They also dedicate a portion of their income to help repopulate the buffalo. I feel like it creates good medicine. And when I say good medicine, that creates good energy and good feeling. And I'm a fervent believer in, in whatever we do, uh, it comes back. And I think the whole native thinking is like that. What, whatever you do comes back to you. And so in thinking like that, you want to do good, good things. Last week, we asked Iowans, what do you remember about the day JFK was assassinated? By your responses, we see that the day is etched in memory. November 22, 1963 was my 17th birthday, and I wore flowers to school for my girlfriends. They then became funeral flowers, and I took them off. What I remember is um, having one of the grouchiest fifth grade teachers I've ever had, and on that day, she cried. My greatest recollection is my mother watching television and vacuuming and crying and vacuuming and crying. What I remember about JFK, I think it's criminal. Our press made a hero out of that guy. My husband was stationed in the Army at Fort Hood, Texas. It was the first armored di division, and they were sent down to Dallas. Uh, some people thought we were going to go to war with someone over this. We were crossing the border from old Mexico, and within a few minutes, the border would be closed to all traffic. We all went into church and started praying, and we, you know, we didn't know what was going to happen. I was in Dallas, Texas, within two blocks of where President John F. Kennedy was shot. When the special reports come on, um, I still get a funny feeling, the same feeling I did that day just hugged each other and, and tried to go on. Thank you. For 28 years, the assassination of John F. Kennedy has claimed the thoughts of everyone old enough to remember it. During those years, Americans have searched emotionally for the truth, and it's no surprise that different theories abound. 
David Bellin was counsel to the Warren Commission and has written two books about the investigation. He urges us to keep just one thing in mind, the facts. I think that this event is important to Iowans because it was an event that literally changed the course and direction of our country. I think that uh, there are many Iowans that also feel that there was an idealism that President Kennedy symbolized that's important. Uh, I feel that that in part has been lost uh, on the part of our country and I would, I would certainly hope that we would someday be able to achieve that measure of idealism that we had. I got a call from the Warren Commission and they said that I had been recommended and they told me about what they were doing and they had had a lot of people apply for the job but uh, they asked me if I was interested. Well, who wouldn't be interested? It was the crime of the century and 10 days later I got a telegram that said, uh, would you please accept appointment as counsel of the Warren Commission. It also launched me on the road to writing books. I have written three books, uh, two involving, one involving the Kennedy assassination exclusively called November 22, 1963, one involving the Kennedy assassination and the CIA investigation, that's called Final Disclosure, and then my Kennedy books have donated royalties to charities so I wouldn't profit from them. Uh, if there is a mistake that the Warren Commission made, it was not in their conclusions that Lee Harvey Oswald was the lone gunman. But what I also know is that the great majority of the world doesn't believe it. Um, particularly when you have movies coming out and things of that kind that sensationalize it. But I really feel that if the Warren Commission proceedings generally would have been held in public with the free press present, there wouldn't be nearly the controversy that there would be right now that would have made a big difference. Well, it's not who I believe killed President Kennedy. It's who actually did kill President Kennedy. And beyond a reasonable doubt, the lone gunman, the only person who fired a shot, was Lee Harvey Oswald. It was his weapon that fired the bullets. They found the ballistically identifiable bullet fragments in the limousine of the bullet that killed President Kennedy. They ballistically were shown to have come from Oswald's rifle that he ordered through the mail. I've held those bullet fragments in my hand, one of the most traumatic experiences of my life. I've examined them under comparison microscopes with the test cartridge uh, found, fired from that rifle and the test bullets. I examined the person that saw the gunman fire, the people that saw the cartridge cases in the assassination window that came from Oswald's rifle, the nearly whole bullet that rolled off the Governor Connolly statue at Parkland Hospital. Oswald was the only one who was inside the building at the time of the assassination, who had access to the assassination window, who fled the building after the assassination. There were six eyewitnesses that identified Oswald as the gunman who killed Tippett, either at the Tippett murder scene or running away from gun in hand, and he was apprehended with a murder weapon. Absolutely, beyond a reasonable doubt, Oswald was a lone gunman. But in the new movie coming out, the Oliver Stone, Kevin Costner movie, you'll never see these witnesses. In the recent five-part A&E series on television, a massive repetition of lies. They hide the most important witnesses and they have witnesses that totally misrepresent the facts. But I know, David Bellin knows from Des Moines, Iowa, that Lee Harvey Oswald was a lone gunman. I think the, there has been a tremendous uh, hidden impact of the lies about the Kennedy assassination. And that's it, it is a central core of undermining the citizen trust in government, of, uh, citizen trust in government and, uh, and the processes of government. If citizens can't believe the findings of a commission headed by the Chief Justice of the United States, a man with the distinguished career of Earl Warren, a person who uh, led the forefront of guaranteeing individual rights, constitutional rights, if they can't believe Earl Warren in an investigation involving the murder of the president, who can they believe? And right now, the overwhelming majority of Americans have been led to disbelieve Earl Warren because a group of people, in large part in movies and in television, have basically used this for commercial exploitation and what, in a sense, I have at times called the prostitution of the assassination. 
Ultimately, I hope people understand the truth because they will see how a relatively small band of assassination sensationalists and people who have commercialized the assassination, like the Oliver Stones of the world, have misled America in a major historical event. And we can understand how media have been exploited to mislead the public. I think we'll be better equipped to prevent this from happening again in the future. And that is a very, very important reason for my taking the time from what is sometimes a fairly hectic schedule to take the time to write because writing is a lonely task. It's an arduous task and it does take a lot of time, but to me it's one of the most important things I can do. The Best of Living in Iowa is funded in part by the Gilchrist Foundation. Founded by Jocelyn Gilchrist, furthering the philanthropic interests of the Gilchrist family in wildlife and conservation, the arts and public broadcasting, and disaster relief. Funding for this program was provided by Friends, the Iowa Public Television Foundation. Generations of families and friends who feel passionate about the programs they watch on Iowa Public Television.